Hey, everybody. Thank you for spending part of your afternoon with me. Uh, my background is technical. I'm a developer. My first startup, our whole team was tech. Uh, we started off, we were building consumer apps. We were building playful creativity tools for kids. Kids didn't want them, but we started getting calls from the movie labels and the music studios, and they're saying, hey, can we license the technology that's underneath this? And we thought, yeah, that seems like a brilliant business. Like, we were running low on money. Like, our investors had been kind to us up until then, but we really needed to figure something out. So we said, hey, this is an opportunity, right? They're calling us how different can <laughs> advertising and playful consumer apps for kids really be. So we jumped into the industry, and as kind of the, uh, the unlucky one on the founding team, I ended up spending the next couple years of my life trying to figure out enterprise sales. And I had a really hard time. I messed up so many perfectly good leads, just totally burned them. And I've seen this repeated over and over. Like, there's these, these really common failure patterns when you're talking to customers. And it takes a ton of time, right? And it's uncomfortable at first. A lot of us aren't built for this. And so if you're going to go through that much discomfort and spend all that energy, you may as well get something valuable back out of it. And I totally believe that value is there. And hopefully today, I, I can show you like a couple uh, just little practical tips to, to get the most out of it. But first is how we can screw it up. The biggest way you screw it up is you, <laughs> you switch into pitching mode. You go in to talk to someone to figure out if your idea is good, right? You go, hey, I'm working on a great idea. It does this and this and this. What do you think? And they go, well, I probably wouldn't use it. And you go, yeah, but it's an HTML5. And they go, still, that doesn't really change it. And you're like, yeah, but it's responsive. <laughs> and, and at some point, they go, you're right, man. That's a great idea. Like, <laughs> let me know when you launch. And you've just you've missed that opportunity for learning. As soon as you switch into, like, let me tell you how great my idea is, boom, boom, boom. Unless they're holding a checkbook, it's really counterproductive because you turn them off uh, from being able to actually tell you what's going on. And this gets into kind of a spiral of death where we go, OK, but we need to impress the first couple guys because if we haven't impressed them, we don't have the evidence to impress later stage people. So they won't let us in. They won't take it seriously. But if you can't get taken seriously on an idea, like you're doing something cool, right? You're starting a company. You're, you're going for it. You've got a vision of what the future should look like. If they won't take you seriously on that, they won't take you seriously with that and a prototype. Like they won't take you seriously with that and a testimonial. Like you've got it already to get in the door and get, uh, get taken seriously and get what you need. It's a slightly different conversation than a sales meeting. Uh, but you know, getting this first one isn't, uh, isn't the barrier. Um, and building the product can help, but it's not necessarily the first step. The way I like to think about this is if you were blindfolded and you were marched out into this field, you were in front of this building, you're blindfolded, you're spun around, you're handed some darts, and you're told to hit the dartboard. Almost nobody here would just start like, you know, did I hit it? No. Like, did I hit it? No. Like, you're going to run out of darts, and your misses aren't getting you any closer to the correct answer. What most of us would do in this situation, we go, OK, which way is the dartboard? It's kind of like, oh, it's behind you, a little more to your left, a little more, OK. You know, yeah, it's about in front of you. Try. Uh, and then we'd start tossing the darts. And the same is true in every kind of like business and, and sales conversation. You start like very open-ended. If you go in and you're just like, this is my idea, buy it, take it. Um, you're just like going in blindfolded after being spun around and throwing a dart. And when someone goes, that's really neat. Let me keep me in the loop. You don't know what you need to change in order to get closer to the bullseye. Um, whereas if you start and you're like, hey, what's going on? How does this industry work? How does your day work? Point me in the right direction. You, you at least get there. And at some point, you do need to commit, right? At some point, you need to jump. If you never throw anything, if you never take that risk, then there's zero chance. Uh, but at least be pointed in the right direction um, before you do. Uh, <laughs> kind of the way I like to think about this is, is, is like this. This is a riddle. If, if you've heard this before, uh, just humor me and don't, don't give away the answer for a moment. But so a man wakes up. He turns on the radio. He runs upstairs. He turns on the light, and he kills himself. Why does this happen? Just sh sh shout out a guess. He wakes up, he turns on the radio, he runs upstairs, he turns on the light, and he kills himself. Why does he do this? Yeah, just yell it out. <laughs> he, he, he was stalked on Facebook? Uh, no. Oh, he had stalks on Facebook. Uh, no, that is not, not what happened, although wonderful. Yeah, no, yeah, just yell. <laughs> All right. I feel like you may have heard this before. <laughs> the what? Gas. No. So what normally happens in this situation, and we had the, we had the answer plucked from the, uh, the infinite range of possibilities, but the, what, like typically, right, you hear a riddle and you go, oh, and your mind starts jumping to conclusions. You go, oh, uh, he turned on the radio and he heard that his wife was sleeping with a celebrity and he couldn't take it, so he ran upstairs to where he keeps the guns and he offs himself. 
Or like, oh, he woke up and it turned out the zombie apocalypse had broke up. These are like real guesses that people make. It's like, no, another guess. They get more and more outrageous and specific. But if you approach this and you go, okay, well, how do I get pointed in the right direction? What did he hear on the radio? He heard a boat crashed. Why did he run upstairs to turn on the light? What was the light? And uh, like, what did he see when he went upstairs? You know, he saw the ocean. It's like, oh, he's a lighthouse keeper. He fell asleep on the job. He forgot to turn on the lights. A boat crashed. It was his responsibility. He heard about the wreck on the radio. Oh, no. He's like, I can't live with myself. He goes upstairs. He verifies. He turns on the light. Like, <laughs> it's impossible when we jump straight to the very specific guesses. You could take a 1,000 guesses, and you're not going to get it, right? And this is what we do over and over and over with our products. We take a total guess and go all the way to the end. It has exactly these features. It looks exactly like this. Will you buy it? No. OK, like you come up with something new, very specific again. Um, Customer development is just bringing that, and even sales. Like, if you look at the way people sell big sales stuff, like when you're selling a house, when you're selling a car, you don't go in and just like hard sell it. You kind of, uh, you know, even bigger than that, the big enterprise sales, um, you kind of you figure out, you get pointed in the right direction first. Um, and those are the, like kind of the ways that, that, that you mess them up. You, you, you pitch it, or you go in um, trying to sell, like too specific. You don't get pointed in the right direction. <laughs> and the problem here, the kicker, is that anybody, any single person in this room, if you get a chance to sit down with them and you're an annoying enough about it, they will eventually say that your idea is awesome. Like, no one can resist this, right? Like, they want to go. They want to leave. Like, the only way to leave is to give you a compliment. They're going to. You get very little information out of that exchange. Um, and this kind of breaks down into the stages that you've seen in customer development. They call them in startups, they call it discovery and validation. But it's actually much simpler than this. You learn if you're pointing in the right direction, then you confirm it by trying to sell someone something. You ask, then you, then you sell. And the big question is, like, do we understand the industry, and does anybody care at all? You would be amazed how many startups go out of business with zero people ever caring that they existed. If you're going to spend x years of your life working on something, you may as well have someone who's sad when you go out of business. Like, you want, like, does it resonate with anyone, with one person? There are literally products no one ever knew they existed. That's a bad result. That's not a good kind of failure. Uh, but you can figure that out really cheaply early by talking to a few people. Um, so that's the discovery. That's am I pointed in the right direction. Once we're ready to validate, once we're ready to start throwing darts, build products, try to sell something, the questions change a little bit. It's are we building specifically the right features, and will people pay us for this? Um, and then later, you're kind of out of the, the, the early stages, and then you, you've got all the growth questions and, and the stuff that comes later which, you know, the growth hackers and all the stuff that, that, that we obsess about. Now, this still leaves us with the challenge of how do we actually get good information from our customers about whether we're building the right thing or not, right? Because if everyone's going to lie to us, like, how does, what chance do we have? And you know how people say you're not meant to ask your mom if your business is a good idea? The reason being that, strangely, your mom is more likely to lie to you than anyone in the world? <laughs> So I actually, I don't think this is true. I think that you shouldn't ask anyone if your business is a good idea. I think the fact your mom will lie to you, that's true, but everyone will lie to you to some extent. Everyone will lie to you a little bit, unless there's some kind of weird benevolent sociopath where they're OK with hurting your feelings. They want so badly to help you that they won't, they'll watch you cry. Like, these people are very rare. When you find one, treasure them. But they're rare, and we can't count on them. And it's not their responsibility to be, to be bearing the burden of truth. It's our responsibility to ask the questions and lead the inquiry in a way where they don't even have the option of lying to us. So I actually think that a good question about your business is one you can ask to your mom. If you can ask your mom, and even if she is unable to lie to you, then that means it's a really well-structured question that you could ask to anyone. Uh, and imagine these two scenarios. You go to your mom. You say, hey, mom, I'm starting a company. You like to cook. We're building an iPad app. You like iPads. Uh, it's going to be like a digital cookbook. It's got videos of your fam famous celebrity chef. You can share your recipes. It sits beside you while you cook. It costs uh, 30 euros, like, uh, like the big hardcover cookbooks you buy already. What do you think? Would you buy something like that? She's going to go, yeah, I love it. That's amazing. You're amazing. Are you staying for dinner? <laughs> I haven't seen you in so long. <laughs> And, and you, go, you go, thanks, mom. No, I got to go build my business. You build your business. No one buys it. Even your mom doesn't buy it. And then you're all upset. <laughs> <laughs> Contrast that with, with a question that we could ask our mom where even she wouldn't be able to lie to us. We go, um, we go hey, mom, how's your new iPad treating you? She goes, oh, I love it. I take it with me everywhere. Best thing ever. And you go, what apps do you use? She goes, oh, I play Sudoku. I read the New York Times. I play Angry Birds. You go, have you bought any? What's the, what kind of, which paid apps do you use? She goes, oh, no, 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 I, don't, I wouldn't put my credit card information in there. I don't trust it. 
I take it to the cafe, someone might steal it, then they'd have my credit card. And you go, well, it doesn't really work that way, but like, that tells you something important about your customer segment. For them, security is like a big issue. Maybe like this is, even though it's a small purchase for them in a bookstore, it's a big purchase for them to make through the iPad. That's real learning about them. You know, if you're like selling into an organization, even if they love the idea, they want it so badly, but their tech guys won't approve it or their lawyers won't approve it, you're not getting through there. The constraints of people's purchases really do matter. And that was a fact that we were able to get out of, out of, out of mom with zero risk of her lying to us because she didn't even know that we were putting our ego at stake. She didn't even know. We, we never told her what our idea was. We never exposed that. And to me, this, this boils down to what I call uh, the, the mom test, which is just three parts. And this is basically just stolen from uh, the user experience and, and, and design thinking communities. But when you're talking to someone and you're trying to discover if you're pointed in the right direction, you don't ask for their opinions. You never say, would you buy this? Do you like this? Do you think this is a good idea? Um, you don't ask about their opinion about your product. Instead, you ask about their life. You ask, like, uh, what are your problems? How do you currently solve it? What are the implications of this problem if we leave it unsolved? Like, how do you currently get around this? And she's like, you know, oh, sticky notes. That's how I get my, my recipes from the computer room to the, to the kitchen. Um, and you ask about specifics. People, when you're talking to them, they'll constantly get off into hypotheticals. Um, I was listening to, uh, to, to uh, an entrepreneur talk to, he was building a tool for PhD researchers, and he wanted to help them basically exchange ideas. And so he was talking, and he's like, hey, isn't it annoying when sometimes you can't uh, find that bit of information you need, and it's like more advanced than Wikipedia has? And so how do, you, how do you get it? Isn't that annoying? And the guy goes, yeah, that is kind of annoying. That's a real problem. Uh, and then this had gone on for a while. And <laughs> eventually someone was kind of like, when's the last time that happened to you? What did you do? And he had to think. There was this unbelievably awkward 30-second pause. And he goes, it was about two years ago. I went down to the coffee shop. And I saw another researcher there, and he pointed me in the right direction. It's like, OK, this is not a problem of the sort of magnitude that we're going to hang a company on. Right? This is like, uh, again, someone, once <laughs> someone was uh, like trying to customer develop me about an idea. And they were, like, they were like, hey, have you ever gone to a restaurant because you wanted something that was only available at that restaurant? And I thought about it for a second. And I'm like, yeah, in London, there aren't that many uh, good burrito places. So I sometimes go to a place just because they have a burrito. So he's like, yes. And he ran away all excited. And I was like, wait, that, like, that was the validation of his problem, which I felt like he was kind of leading me there. I don't know that I would necessarily like, think he should invest his time in that. But so there's like, you have to take responsibility. You can always get confirmation if that's what you're looking for. right? You have to take responsibility for uh, laying the question out in a way which makes it easy for them to knock down. The best experience of this I ever had, I was uh, thinking about um, like some of my buddies were investors, and I was like, man, I was so annoyed at email at the time. I was like, deal flow must be a nightmare for them, keeping track of all the people they're talking to. Not, not deal flow, but managing it. You, know? you must get thousands of inbound inquiries. How do you keep track of everyone? Uh, and so I thought, OK. I, like woke, I was so excited, I woke up. I was like, oh, I'm a genius. And uh, so I started doing sketches and diagrams and business models. And then uh, so I, quit, I called a couple of people, and I was like, hey, can I come in and catch up for a coffee? They're like, yeah. And so I went in and I, I was like, hey, by the way, you guys must do a ton of deals. How do, you, how do you deal with all, how do you cope with all of that? It must be totally overwhelming. And he sort of shrugs and he points to the wall and he goes, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, you know, we kill most of them as soon as they arrive and the remainder we just stick on the wall. And I look over and there's like 10 post-it notes. And that was their CRM. Like that's how they manage this like huge firm's deal flow. I was like, huh. And then he's like, by the way, what did you want to talk about? I'm like, nothing, I'm good. <laughs> You know, uh, like, because it was just completely invalidated. And he, he never, like, it was never even clear that I was exposing that as an idea. Um, so are these good or bad questions? Just yell. Uh, do you think it's a good idea? Bad. Yeah. Uh, would you buy a product that would solve this problem? Yeah. Market researchers love this one. Terrible. Uh, like, because everyone says yes. Would you go to a place which allows you to get chiseled six-pack abs for... 30 minutes a day, and you're like, yeah, sign me up, and then you never go to the gym. It's like people are really overly optimistic when they're committing to buy things in the future. How do you currently deal with this problem? Yeah, it's awesome. You're talking about their life. A great side effect of this one, too, is sometimes they'll say they currently deal with it by spending a ton of money. One of my favorite iPad apps, it was, or sorry, iPhone apps, when the iPhone um, app store first launched, it cost $1,000 because it helped you study for the legal bar in America. And like the way people currently solve that problem, they don't solve it with a $1 iPhone app. They solve it by spending five grand on tutors. 
So like the, the magnitudes of the problem can really, uh, really catch you off guard. Talk me through the last time you had it. Again, this is awesome. Uh, user experience guys will take this so far as they'll be like, can I just come sit in your house while you do that? Can I like, watch you do email? <laughs> I, had, I opened up a bank account, and the, uh, my, my branch manager was like, so is it cool if I just come to work with you tomorrow? I'm like, I work in a cafe, but yeah. Like, bring your computer. You're going to have a fun day. <laughs> um, but you know, you can kind of like, you get the realities of people. How much would you pay for this? Bad. Um, how much money does it cost you is like the very good version of this. Most of the bad questions are getting at good information just in a way which causes people to lie to you. You want to know how much money they would pay for it. But if you ask them how much they'd pay for it, they lie to you. They don't mean to. They just do. They're just being overly optimistic. They're forgetting all the little nitty gritty that goes into actually buying and starting to use something new. How much does it cost you is like the flip version of that. Asking about the budgets is the flip version of that. There you're getting into the realities of their life and not their opinion about your product. Um, is there a budget? And every meeting ends with who else should I talk to? Um, if you're like not getting introduced, it's a good sign that you're just like totally off. You're either in completely the wrong market or you're wildly misrepresenting it or you're like, like something's wrong, and it's not uh, wrong forever. You can go back and fix it. But if people aren't introducing you to more people, you need to like have like a deep think, you know, before you take the next meetings. Because like bridges aren't really burned if they get replaced by another bridge, right? That's just like you can go through it. Um, and there's a second part to it, right? So I said there's there's these two stages of the startup. There's the discovery stage, the the learning, and then there's the validation, the confirming. Once you're ready to start confirming, once you're pointed in the right direction because you understand their life, you've, you've asked questions which pass the mom test, suddenly the meetings have a different focus. Like, did you know every meeting either, either succeeds or fails? There's not just a good meeting. There's either failed meetings or successful meetings. And what makes a meeting a success is that you get commitment to advance to the next stage. Most of what we're doing, uh, anything, whether you're selling your product if it's big, uh, whether you're lining up partnerships, whether you're raising funding, that doesn't happen over one interaction. If you're selling someone a cheap watch, you can be like, buy it, buy it, buy it. You can force them into just being like, fine, take my money. But if you're selling something big, which has an ongoing relationship, that doesn't work. It actually actively backfires. Um, and so in all of these, there's multiple stages, which means success in a meeting. It isn't to immediately close them, but it's just to advance to the next stage, whatever the next stage happens to be. So this, sounds great, I love it. You just had a meeting with an excited investor. Sounds great, I love it. Like, totally failed meeting. You can fix that if you ask for a commitment. It's like, great, pre-order it. Great, introduce me to your boss. All of these things can be fixed, but right now, she gave you nothing. Brilliant, let me know when it launches. Exactly the same, a little bit trickier. <laughs> it's a compliment plus a stalling tactic. These two tend to go together. <laughs> I'll call you on Thanksgiving. You know, Don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> I got that one, actually. Like, that's verbatim. That's a quote from my, like, my first week of sales. I was like, it's great. <laughs> I walked out of the room. The rest of my team was like, how did it go? How did it go? And I'm like, it's great. We're going to talk again in Thanksgiving. And everyone was like, hmm. <laughs> uh, there are a couple people I can introduce you to when you're ready. It's kind of great. Like, what does when you're ready mean? I once talked to someone from Google Acquisitions, and he was like, he was like yeah, this is a really cool product. I'll bring you in. We can acquire you when you're ready. <laughs> Turns out when we're, I was like, it took me a couple months, and I went back and I was like, wait, what, what's ready? And he's like, you know, doing like five million a year in revenue. I was like, oh, okay. Not like when I'm mentally prepared. <laughs> this is something that shows promise, but like pin them down. Okay, who is it? What do you need to see? Sometimes they'll be like, honestly, you're just not ready. You're not far enough, right? That's totally reasonable. If they'll tell you like you hit these milestones, then I can definitely introduce you. Like that's awesome. Uh, but you need that out of them. Right now, again, this is kind of a stalling commitment or a stalling commitment. Yeah, that's actually a good name for it. I would definitely buy that. Most dangerous of all, yeah. <laughs> I said this to someone the other day. He pulled out an iPad and took my bank details. He was like, would you sign up for this service? I was like, yeah, definitely. He's like, OK, here you go. So, <laughs> so now I'm paying him $350 a week. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the first startup I ever worked for, before I started my own, uh, I was in university. I was an intern at this, this other startup. It was 10 people. They did a bunch of market research. They asked people, they're like, hey, do you like this? Would you buy it? Back when the team was small, 10 people. Uh, everyone was like, yeah, I'd love that. I would pay way more than you're asking for that. I, I wouldn't just pay $20 a month. I'd pay $50 a month. This is incredible. It had... Um, it like, uh, touched on a lot of nostalgia stuff. It was like all these old games from the 80s. People thought it was really cool. And 
what happened was uh, that gave the, the, the business the confidence to basically put their blinders on to license like multi-million dollars worth of IP and essentially to not go back to the market to figure out if they were doing the right thing. So the team blew up to about 150 people. They launched, nobody bought it. The team reduced to about 10 people. And then a tiny startup bought uh, the assets for, for pennies on the dollar, which is a great result for them, but a bad result for the original team. And that happened from this like, this like good but dangerous signal. I would definitely buy that. You know, you really need to dig in more to that. There might be something good underneath it, but you need to take responsibility for getting the truth out. Um, in general, it comes down to opinions being worthless. You'll get a ton of opinions. If you've ever had like any meeting you sit down to, this is also a common, if you're a new entrepreneur and you sit down, you're talking to mentors, you're talking to investors, advisors, you'll get friends, you'll get so many opinions bouncing around. Um, and a really helpful way to ground it, uh, it's it just be like, that's an awesome idea. If you were in our shoes, would you be focusing on that this week? And they'll usually go, no, but it's a good idea for three years from now. And you go, yeah, yeah that's, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, so, and when you're talking to, to customers as well, the opinions, they don't have a huge amount of value. Um, but lock them down into specifics about their lives and really be careful of these false positives because that's when you dig the big hole for yourself. You know, if it's a false negative and you walk away from an idea which had a little promise or it was going to be okay, I mean, normally you know when something's going great, right? But when you really get locked into something on like false pretenses, someone's saying, I would definitely buy that. It's like, it's a bit harder. Um, we got in trouble with, with one of our products because the, uh, the executives, the head creatives, the, all the VCs, the senior guys, we were selling into uh, cr cr creative brands or sorry, uh, creative agencies and, and entertainment brands. They're like, we love it, we love it, we love it. And so like, we raised a round based on that evidence. We like, spent all our time, we, we invested in a ton of tech, and it turned out their, their legal teams wouldn't approve the purchase. Because it was kind of unclear, you know, and they're like, eh, we don't really want to be the case study in that way. And so we had this false positive where we'd sunk a lot of energy into it based on what the senior people had told us, when it, it turned out not to be true. Um, so these stages break down into different goals for when you're talking to people. When you're doing the, the discovery, when you're first trying to figure out, like, do, does anyone care at all? You're looking for facts about their life. Whereas once you've actually got a product idea, you're saying, I think these are the features. I think this is how it works. I think this is how it fits into their day. Um, then you're looking for commitments. Um, commitments come in a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different uh, stages. In the sales lingo, they call this advancement. Uh, so permission to contact them again is pretty good. A specific meeting date is even stronger. Sometimes you have a meeting with people and like, as the meeting's ending, they're like, we're out of time. They open their calendar and they're like, when's the next one? Like that was a great meeting. Sometimes you have a meeting and they're like, hold on, do you have 10 more minutes? And they take you down the hall and start introducing you to other people on the team. Amazing meeting, right? Like there's, uh, there's clear advancement to what happens next. Introduction to decision maker, uh, commitment to run a trial, uh, Pre-purchase is the killer. The reason Kickstarter is so strong is because it allows you to get completely concrete commitment with no chance of getting lied to. You're actually putting people to a purchase decision. But often in bigger sales, that's not possible, right? You're not going to sell enterprise software on, on, on Kickstarter. Well, I'm, actually, I don't know. But like, so someone, there's other forms of, of social or time commitment they can give you. Uh, and just remember, compliments are like the, the huge warning to look out for. Um, in practical terms, um, I tend to go into these meetings with three questions. There's just three questions, they're on my mind. Um, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I found more than that, it gets a bit overwhelming. If you're just reading from a huge list of 1,000 questions, it's obvious you're trying to fill in a questionnaire. I don't get that much value out of it. Over time, your questions change. They evolve as you get more information about your business. Um, and, and I write it down. When you're working in a team, I actually lost a CTO in one of my companies because he thought I was being a, uh, like, a like an all over the place leader that I was making willy nilly decisions. But actually what was happening was he wasn't in touch with the customers, whereas I was. And I was doing a bad job of communicating what the customers were saying to him. I was telling, I was saying like, oh wait, we need to change the product in this way. And that was actually correct, right? Like I knew it from the customers and it was correct, but I hadn't shown him the customer learning. I'd only given him the ultimate command. And that was like a really bad dynamic. And so he thought we were just always changing direction. So writing it down is really useful. Whether you do it digitally or on paper, um, I carry around, I carry, I don't have them. Anyway, I carry around these packs of cards. Like if you bump into me later, you'll see them. And I just write down quotes, like one per card, so you can rearrange them. Uh, and I stick emotion symbols on them. Uh, the emotions are obvious. Embarrassment is an emotion no one thinks about when they're doing this kind of research. Like what's people's main feeling about email? It's actually not rage, it's embarrassment. It's like, yeah, I know I should get back to that. I feel terrible. There's like a lot of business problems around embarrassment that you can solve. Um, and then the bottom ones, 
Someone's like, it's a huge problem. This is a big pain point. These are like, yeah, uh, how many cloud startups have died because the cloud stuff they were doing wasn't allowed by the big company's tech department. It's like, so if you're talking to someone, he's like, ah, oh, I would love to use Google Docs, but our tech guys won't allow it. You know, or our security guys won't allow it. These are big blockages that you got to know about. Um, and it's helpful to do them in teams of two. It's like a bit weird. Again, you want to get rid of that interview dynamic. If you have to do it uh, with just one person, I, it's just like, hey, is it cool if I record this just so I can pay attention to you and don't have to take notes? People are always like, yeah, that's fine. You just put your phone down. Um, and the last couple, uh, one, two, three things I'll say. Um, when you're in these sales meetings, it's really tempting to go for the close. You want the money, right? It's like there's a big check at the end of the rainbow. You want it. Depending on the stage, this tends to be a mistake. And this is why startups, early stage startups, can't hire salespeople. It's so many technical founders' dream. It, it was my dream for the longest time to just hire salespeople and be done with it. But so much of the early stage sales is about figuring out how it fits into their lives. It's about figuring out like what works and what doesn't, right? It's that beginning exploratory phase. And if you hire a salesperson, he's got like really mixed incentives. He either comes back to you and says the business is fundamentally flawed, in which case you're like, well, it sounds like you're a bad sales guy, and you fire him. Or he, come, he just like pushes for the sale, and you don't actually get the learning back. So it really has to be something the founders are doing. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, my final thing that <laughs> I wanted to say, like, there's, there's all these tactics. Like, the last 20 slides were just tactics, like things you can do. You can organize meetups. You can blah, blah, blah. We don't need to get that hung up on this. There's like Alexander the Great. This is like a myth, but he saw the Gordian knot. You had to, if you untied it, you became the ruler of the world. No one could figure it out. He's like, I'm not playing this game, right? He takes his sword. He hacks through the knot. He's like, there, I untied it. My favorite kind of customer development thing ever, um, we were talking to a guy who was a personal trainer. We started getting all theoretical. We were like, OK, how can we change your customer segment? How can we improve your business model? The problem is he was having to drive from client to client, so he was losing like 2 thirds of his day commuting. So at some point, he's like, wait, the police. I should be training the police. You go there, you get a ton of police officers. You can train all of them. That's great. That would solve all my problems. I bet they pay more, too. And we start theorizing, OK, how do we figure this out? How do we figure this out? And he goes, what are, you, are you guys being, you're being stupid. Like, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call them. He's like, we're like, what? He goes, I'm going to call the police. So he like went outside and got a coffee and called the police. He's like, hey, how do you guys stay in shape? And like that turned into his business, right? We don't need to get hung up on all this stuff and the theory. Like sometimes you just pick up the phone and you like ask people. You're like, hey, does the business work this way? What does the budget look like? You know, so you can do that. Thanks a lot. <laughs>